Thanks, Holly. It's really, really nice to be here. Really, really grateful to kind of have this space this morning to kind of talk through some ideas and hopefully hear a little bit about what everyone's up to and sort of have some conversation around working with audio um, and then kind of go into a few tips and tricks and just introductory things to maybe think about when working with Audacity. So, um, yeah, we're going to run up until one o'clock, so just under two hours now. Um, and initially I was really kind of interested in how to kind of have a discussion, first of all, to start things off, which is why there was that kind of really small brief about bringing a piece of audio along with you. Um, and something that I'm quite interested in is the different kind of conversations that people have around, well, around music predominantly, it's something that is quite important in some of my own practice and research around kind of cultural histories um, and cultural production and the roles that kind of um, predominantly Jamaica has played in sort of a British context today. Um, but in thinking about some of those histories, quite a lot of the stuff that I do is kind of thinking about other people's relationships to sound. Um, hopefully, if people are working or planning to work as the session's going on, you've got a version of Audacity downloaded already. Um, if not, then yeah, as I mentioned, it's a really, really straightforward, really simple, um, free open source software that I really, really love just for the fact that it's quite accessible. Um, so you can go to audacityteam.org to download. It's available on Mac and on Windows. Um, so yeah, really, really easy to get hold of and to, and to kind of download and start working. First of all, I'm sure a few of you are already familiar and know of it, but um, I'm just going to talk through really briefly uh the interface and the things that are kind of coming up on screen so in the way that i usually like to start is just by familiarizing with everything um i it's usually okay but the thing that i always start with is just checking that the settings are right and um, so that i don't have to fiddle with things further down the line and that's to do with the project rate which is measured in hertz in the bottom left hand corner and it should always be 44,100. Um, and it will be in 16 bit. If it's not, I work on a Mac computer, so I'm just gonna go to um, the preferences to show you how to change that. So you just click on Audacity, preferences and quality. And yeah, the default sample rate, as I said, should always be 44,100 and sample format of 16 bit. And then hit okay. Um, and then to start, some people will like to record directly into Audacity. Some people maybe are working with other material that they've collected and recorded elsewhere. Um, I usually use Audacity to kind of piece together longer pieces of work or to clean up kind of isolated tracks or bits of recording or audio. So I, mostly I kind of drag and drop or import. So yeah, there are two ways that you can kind of get things into, into the, um, the screen to navigate. So um, for example, I'm not sure if you can see my whole screen, but you'll see kind of a file appear magically if not. So I'm just dragging and dropping one in from there and it will kind of appear like that on the timeline. And the other way is to go to file, import, audio, and it will bring up, um, yeah, bring up your, bring up your computer and bring up where all your, you'll be able to navigate and find all of your files. So that's, Kind of getting started and to navigate around the rest of the screen just so people are familiar if you're working on a mac um, your audio host will usually say core audio if you're on a windows computer it will say you can you should select windows direct sound um, and along here and if you hover over each of these you can see it kind of comes up and lets you know what each of these things are so you've got your recording device, which will be on for me at the moment, my built-in microphone, but there might be other devices that you use. Um, and Audacity, like I say, does have a built-in function, but the laptop speak, uh, laptop mics aren't always the greatest. So there are lots of really, really great USB microphones that you can get um, that are really, really good quality. And quite often you'll be able to pick up for usually under around a hundred pounds. 
So we recommend doing that if you're kind of recording dialogue or recording directly into Audacity to kind of have a plug-in one rather than from your computer. Um, and then you've got your recording channels. So that'll either be in mono, which is um, on one channel or stereo, which will come through through, through both. And what I'd usually suggest is if you, again, if you're recording directly into Audacity to initially do it in mono and then make it a stereo track later on down the line, just because it means it's easier to kind of work with that individual individual clip and then clean it up a little bit and kind of duplicate it and, and merge them together. So I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. Um, and then you have your playback device which will just be sort of what it's playing through so at the moment through through my headphones. But if you have sort of any additional speaker setups or anything, that's where you'll be able to change that. Um, just along the top, I work this way backwards. Um, we have the playback volume, which is just for sort of the in-ear or through the speakers, not actually how it's coming, not actually the levels that are coming out. So they're slightly different. Um, so it's just kind of within Audacity. Um, how loud does it, the project sounds, not the volume as it's being exported. Um, you've got your recording volume for, again, if you're working within Audacity, what the microphone records at, usually we'd say around 0 0.5 is a good level to avoid any sort of distortion or clipping. So around halfway on that slider. Um, and then I'm gonna jump up to this side actually. So the play controls, which are quite straightforward and I hope you're all familiar with. So obviously you pause, play, stop, skip back to the start, skip through to the end and record. And then the little square here is probably the most, the tools that you'll be using the most, I think, or the tools that I seem to use the most when I'm working within Audacity. Um, and the first one is a selection tool. Um, which is, well, it basically allows you to kind of pick and choose a certain area of the, of the track that you're working with um, and drag and drop it across or drag and drop it to highlight particular areas. But it seems it's the one that I seem to have on and return to and use the most. Um, and I'll go into sharing of what these kind of do and you'll be able to kind of follow in a sec, but just quickly to kind of familiarize with the interface. Um, the next one along is the envelope tool. So every track that you work with has an amplitude envelope, which is controlled by that envelope tool or on the toolbar. And it just means that you can control um, how something fades or the, how something kind of smooths and fades in or fades out. And again, I'll kind of show you that so you can have a visual of it in a little while. Um, and the draw tool, which I don't use so much, but I think could be quite handy potentially for cleaning up things. So the draw tool basically lets you redraw the waveform. So at the point where there's maybe like heavy clicks or things that need to be repaired, you can zoom in really, really closely and just kind of like click and redraw what that line or where that line of the wave waveform is. Um, so you can, you'll, again, you'll see when, when we work through, but you can click and individually change and drag um, and repair any sort of bits that are a little bit a little bit distorted or clipping. Um, just underneath that, you've got the zoom, which is self-explanatory, really. You can zoom in and out on the timeline with that. Um, the time shift tool, which allows you to select a clip and then drag it over to a different area of the, of the timeline that you're working on to the right or left. Um, and then the multi-tool, which allows you to kind of combine all of those functions. And again, not really something that, that I use too much, actually. I'm not sure about other people, but you have the option to kind of select and envelope and draw at the same time if you should want or need. Um, and then just down to the bottom, we have the cut, the copy and the paste which work in exactly the same way as you might do in a, in a Microsoft Word document or something similar. Um, to the right of that, we have the trim audio outside of selection. And just to the left, to, to further on, sorry, to the right of that is the silence audio selection. Um, and they're really, really handy 
there are kind of what's good about audacity is there are multiple ways of doing the same thing and again you'll find the way that maybe feels quite intuitive or easiest for you but there are a couple of different ways of you maybe silencing something in the audio that you need to to get rid of or that you need to change or or move but that's one of the ways that you can do that um the undo and the redo really really useful probably the buttons that i click the most when i'm editing and working with sound to go back it's it's endless and you can kind of return to any point that you need um so yeah really useful another zoom tool for you to kind of go in or out on your timeline and when your audio is getting a little bit lengthy um you have the fit selection to width or the fit project to width and that just allows you to be able to see kind of the whole back level and your recording level so if we were to maybe i'll do a little test now actually so i'll hit record and as i record you'll see this bar kind of going up and that's how we just monitor the levels of everything and as i said we want to make sure that that's at 0 0.5 um the quality won't be the best just because it's through through the headphones that i've got on but just so you can get a sense of what it's doing and what it's picking up um at this side is where it will peak so the sounds measured measured in in decibels up to zero decibels is kind of like the top of the room we want to refer to it as and it will go to kind of be getting a little bit red if it's too loud or if it's distorting and between that will kind of go from green to orange in between and when it gets to that kind of level then maybe there's there's some repairs that might need to be done or your volume maybe your recording level sorry maybe needs to be altered so if i'm clicking there you can see that just kind of going up and down in correspondence to my voice um and then when i play back the playback level will do the same just get rid of that um so yeah i think it's really really useful just not not with just with audacity but just to have a real basic understanding of what is happening on the screen because quite often and i've used other programs when i've been like video editing mainly because i'm not really that comfortable or that well versed in it and i'll open something like final cut and just go what does what are all of these things and just being able to kind of familiarize with what each of the different areas i think is really really handy and really useful hopefully um so yeah that's a really really kind of quick overview of, of the interface the different tools and what kind of happens um in those different kind of areas what i'm going to do now is try to import um a little bit of audio. Um, I'll try and do it this way. So I'm just going to have a quick look and try and pull up some audio. So something really straightforward that just recorded. Um, in fact, I should probably talk about that as well, actually. So uh, there are lots and lots of different things that I'm interested in in recording that mean that there's varying qualities. And sometimes it's quite interesting to just think about what changes in those qualities. So if I'm ripping something from the internet, for example, and it's music based, there'll be some there's like there's like a texture or a tone or a quality to something that's like ripped and pirated and bootlegged that means it's not a the optimum kind of point of listening if it's been recorded in a studio right and maybe some of those qualities are something that i want to retain in a similar way i quite sometimes use the voice notes on my phone or the voice memos to record things and work with them and the quality of that is very different to using my zoom microphone but um what will happen when you import is that it will mean the waveforms on here are very, very different at times. So sometimes um, it will clip and it'll be really high and it'll be really loud. And sometimes it'll be quite quiet, but there are different ways you can maybe amplify or kind of reduce some of those areas. Um, and this is a recording that I've just taken using um, my Zoom kind of portable microphone. Um, the, it looks like this little fluffy kind of extension on and I just kind of use it at the moment to make field recordings as I, as I walk around near to where I live. 
Okay, so this is a clip that was ripped from YouTube. So you can see the waveforms are slightly louder, slightly bigger as it appears on screen. So I'll let it play through and see if we can pick up, see if it picks up the louder moments on it. Right, and apologies for anyone in headphones because I know that was quite loud. Um, but the nature of that particular recording, because it was, like I say, ripped from YouTube, um, because it had been edited a little bit, um, meant that as it was playing back, you might have seen it was clipping on here. So it was getting red towards the end. And it's really bled out anyway because it's been ripped and pulled from online. But there are ways that we can kind of treat that and repair that. Um, and I like to think of doing that in kind of four different steps. And that starts with, um, it starts with a um, tool called noise reduction. And then I usually EQ it a little bit by either using um, a filter, filter gate or a, um, a graphic EQ, which are all in the effects here. Filter curves, sorry, or a graphic EQ. Um, and then after that, I would use a compressor and then I would normalize it. And then I'd put it into another timeline or another, another kind of section or another, another kind of longer clip of audio. So I'm going to slowly just kind of use some of these tools um, and give you an idea of how I'd kind of get to that point and then start to layer it up with a couple of other tracks. Apologies for that bit of, um, a bit of a false start as well there. I think that, that first clip, like Veronica will say, maybe was a little bit too, too quiet and too subtle, but hopefully this will be a little bit better. Um, so I, first of all, just using the selection tool, just to give you an idea of how and what that maybe does. If I have that section up to a minute and I don't want to use it anymore, I can literally click and drag from the start up to there. And there are different things that I can then do with that. I might decide that I don't need that first minute of audio and I can hit backspace or I can hit cut and it will completely get rid of it and bring everything back up to zero. Um, I might decide that I want it to be quite a slow fade in and I want it to kind of build up to in a smooth way up to that minute. So I can then either go to effect and fade in. And can you see it's just kind of shrunk a little bit. I'll go back and then redo it. It just kind of pulls it down a little bit from the start and makes it a little bit smoother. Um, and I can keep doing that as many times as I want by hitting that repeat fade in. And you can see each time I do it, it will go further and further down, further and further down. And it will eventually get to a point where that line is entirely flat. But what I want is it to be quite subtle. Maybe there's something else when I'm thinking of it in terms of like a longer piece, but maybe there's something else that it fades in from. Um, so I can do the fade in tool. I'll go back to the start again. Um, another way of completely silencing it would be on here. So that's all that we meant that I mentioned briefly earlier, silence audio and selection. And again, just by highlighting that first minute and clicking silence, you can see how it just entirely flattens that line. Um, so like I say, it's really great because there are multiple ways that you may be, depending on what you're working with or working on, you can just kind of really quickly do all of these kind of okay right transition into that or actually I don't want any of that bit and I can get rid of it entirely um so that's a couple of ways of thinking about how to do that fade in um let me have a quick back and look back over my notes another way of potentially moving some of those areas down I'm going to just like highlight this first section here You 
you can see it stops and resets back to the start just where I've highlighted. So again, if there are particular sections you want to focus in on, you can highlight, but then also make use of that zoom function to go all the way in. And actually, I just want to get that first introduction there. And maybe I decide that I want to use that on another track, or maybe I decide that there's something that I don't quite like about it. But if, again, if I wanted to get rid of that, I could cut, go to tracks, add a new mono track, bring it back to the start. And that needs to be a stereo track. And that's that clip that we've just kind of removed on another track. And then I'm able to kind of move that anywhere that I want and it might go into a different kind of section. Um, so I'll just undo and go back to where it was originally because there's something else that I want to do. And like I say, it's not something that I use too much, but just so you can get a sense of what it does um, is the draw tool. So if I'm going to zoom right the way in and the closer that I get, you'll see that waveform starts to turn into more of a line and even closer starts to turn into a series of dots. And what that draw tool does is allow you to literally click on each of those dots and reposition things. So there might be an area that that first clip that wasn't coming through, for example, that I really want to focus in on just a particular kind of shrill bird song and I can use that draw tool to kind of find a start point and go actually I'm going to start to bring it all the way up and I'm just doing that by clicking and dragging and it works in the opposite direction as well if there's a louder section um, and can you see where it's now like peaked a little bit so that's the bit that I've drawn on um, and when you zoom out it almost doesn't seem like there's too much going on but when you get further and further into that there's so many um, so many little bits you can kind of like pull out and draw out. And that's maybe something, just thinking about that soundscape um, that Claire, you were talking about and being able to have these like lots of different multiple layers or finding kind of a particular area of it that you maybe want to pull out, but that's maybe something that could be quite interesting to think about. So as well as like bringing things out, also making things, in fact, I'll use the same clip just so we can kind of stay in the same area. Um, pulling things back down and just like I say it's a really great way of repairing things um, that maybe you hadn't realized were, were peaking or were, were clipping in a way that um, that didn't really come through on the recording initially so I brought it down, down a little bit not entirely but you, you get a sense of what what that function does um, and the other thing that I haven't mentioned is shortcuts and what you'll find is when you hover over some of these different buttons that will in brackets will tell you what the shortcut is so some of them are kind of universal like i was mentioning if you're using google docs or microsoft word copy and paste on a mac is always going to be command and c and command and v but there are ways you can change that to make it um easier and more useful on sort of what it relates to on the keyboard so something that I like to do is just go to my preferences. And if you go to preferences keyboard, it gives you all of these shortcut commands. And you can do a key search, uh, do a search, sorry, for a key term and change that shortcut to whatever you want it to be. So for example, one that I've done, if I type in silence um, is, to silence the audio, I can't remember what the shortcut was before, but I have just changed that to S. So anytime that I highlight something in my timeline and click S, I know that it's gonna move that section that I've highlighted to just be a flat line. So again, it, it's entirely what feels comfortable for you, for you really, but there are multiple ways of being able to use these shortcuts and use the tools that are already kind of visible on screen to, to work in your whatever way feels most intuitive for you. Um, 
what I'm going to do now is just move on to some of that audio, audio processing chain, which I think is a really useful thing. Um, in fact, no, what I'll do before that even is just go onto the envelope tool because that's another really useful one. Um, I am going to just click out of that. And once you've kind of made your selection or you've, you want to move away from that area, you can just simply click away from the highlighted blue and light and, and light blue highlighted area in light blue, sorry. And it will take you away from that. So if I come out a little bit and say that from here, because I can see that it's slightly louder, but I know that that's also maybe where the singing stops and there's something that's more kind of more loud and more um, musical that's going on. So I might decide from that point is all I want. Um, I'm going to use that other tool, trim outside of the selection to just focus on that section. And it gets rid of everything either side of it and just gives me that. And underneath, um, if I were to be recording some dialogue, for example, and using my voice, um, I want to make that on another track. And I don't know if I have any actually that are saved at the moment, but I'll just record on a new channel in a sec. So I'm going to keep that there and go to track, add new mono track, and just hit stop and skip to the end because I want it to, I want the recording that I'm about to make to start from that point. Um, but again, if you want it to kind of be at four minutes, you can click from there and record from that point. But I want this to be from the start. So I'll go back to the start. I made it a mono track, as I said, because when I'm recording through here, I want to just work on a single and then be able to clean it up and put it, merge it together to make a stereo further down the line. So I'm just going to click record. Um, just going to check my recording level. I might put it up a little bit just because it's quite quiet. And I know that I'm working through sort of Apple headphones and through my laptop and not a plug in USB mic. So I'll put that recording level up a little bit. And can you see just from there, I've not clicked on the right channel there. So you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll edit that in a sec, but just from there, it's kind of picking up everything. And in comparison to that audio that's been ripped from YouTube, the levels are so much lower, um, which means that the waveform that shows up on the screen is a lot lower too. So let me just get rid of that and make sure that I'm on the right track. I'll go back to here. I'm going to mute that one. Now I'm not 100% sure why it's skipping to this point. But maybe I'll just make the recording from here for now and then move it down. But the reason I wanted to make this, and I'm going to kind of leave some gaps in there just for a sec, and then um, we'll zoom in and have a look at it in more detail. But yeah, if I was to be recording dialogue, if I was to be recording a podcast, if I was to be thinking about maybe a conversation that I'm recording through Zoom, which is something that I know has happened quite a lot with different types of broadcast and just thinking about the ways that we might kind of record during during lockdown. Um, I can leave that running and it will kind of do its thing and be picking everything up. But And then when I'm ready to stop, I can use the space bar or I can use the stop tool up here. So what I'm going to do now is just double to click on that. I'm going to use my shortcut, which is Command X, where I could use the cut tool. I'm going to click down here. No, I'm not. Maybe I'll put it directly into a stereo track. There we go. And the reason that I wanted to kind of leave those gaps and I'll zoom in 
and put the gain right up is because depending on the room that you're in, those moments of silence, and if we just think about that draw tool again, those moments of silence are picking something up. So if I put that gain right up, hopefully you'll be able to hear, I'm not sure how well it will come through. But could you hear that hiss? There's like a really subtle hiss and a fuzz and that's just coming through from my room because of my laptop and you know the heater or the fridge or whatever. But in those moments of silence, there'll always be something that's picked up that maybe doesn't quite come up on, on your waveform here. And if you're recording dialogue or if you're recording kind of any sort of voice recording, what's really useful is to do a noise reduction. And to do that, those moments of silence are really important. So I'm just going to highlight that bit where the waveform seems flat um, and then come up here and go to effect and noise reduction. And first of all, to do that noise reduction, Audacity needs to almost like know what the silence is and get a profile of the silence. And then you can apply it to the rest of that clip. So depending on what that hiss or what that fuzz is like, um, I'll be able to get the noise profile and it just analyzes that moment there. And then if I double click on that and go to effect, noise reduction okay it will change and you can see it just kind of process something ever so slightly I'm not sure how how well it shows through on the timeline but ever so slightly what it's basically done is kind of leveled out all of those hisses all those moments of silence um throughout the whole clip and throughout the whole of that audio or throughout the whole, the whole of that bit of dialogue it's particularly useful like i say when you're kind of using the voice um uh, sorry, does it just apply across the clip or would it apply across the whole yeah, track? Yeah. Just, a, just that particular clip. So just okay. on kind of what that selection is. I'm just seeing a comment from Carol saying, would you recommend recording a general silence? I think just two or three seconds in advance, at the, at the end or at the, at the start, um, just before you kind of start speaking. They're usually really, really useful when it comes to editing. And that's with anything really, not just kind of with recording the voice, really useful to just kind of, establish the surroundings in the environment before you get any actual stuff that you want to be can, getting can i just say what i meant was you know when you you're creating a whole soundscape and mm -hmm. you might be pulling in sounds from different places would you recommend mm -hmm. having like a sort of um i don't know as track zero so that it's kind of pulling all those sounds together in a kind of silent way do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I guess so. To fill in the holes, to fill in the holes and so so you go easily from one sound to another without mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. kind of background mm -hmm. noise. Yeah, yeah. I think um the and the way that I'm kind of doing this is it means that once you've done them individually, it's almost like you do you, you treat them as like individual tracks or individual clips, and then when you've put them into um a longer kind of soundscape they kind of come together in, in sort of a, the, there's, a, there's a tool called normalization, um, which brings everything together in sort of relation to one another on, on this timeline, you know? Um, and you can apply that to, it might be that individual track or it might be that you select four tracks if you've got them or 50 tracks if you've, if you've got them, but it kind of brings everything sort of in response to one another to, this, to a similar kind of range and frequency of silence or of, it's absolute highest peaks you know um that digitally the thing that i was talking about which, mm, which mm. Done analog in analog mm. yeah right okay yeah um and yeah for that again so just seeing a comment from veronica asking about that again so to highlight an area of silence um go to effect noise reduction get noise profile so with nothing else in it, but just a bit where it's kind of flat on the waveform. And then highlight your whole clip. Um, noise reduction again. And this time you can press OK. And it also gives you a preview as you do it. So you can kind of change how much it's being reduced by on this slider um, or how sensitive it might be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
so that's one of the first ones in the audio processing and it doesn't really work so much for kind of things like traffic um or for individual clicks but like i say if you're recording conversation or dialogue and it's in a room and picking up sort of, sort of the ambient sounds around the room then it works really well for that um i'm gonna really quickly show the envelope tool so i'll zoom out ever so slightly and get rid of get rid of a section from here i'm gonna say Um, and yeah, to show you the envelope tool really quickly, it's really useful, again, if you're kind of thinking about dialogue or if you're thinking about voiceovers, perhaps, um, but the envelope tool, um, like I say, allows you to kind of just make things really smooth and control the volume in a, in a easy, straightforward way. So I'm just selected it up here. And if I click, uh, I'm going to say around this point and then again around this point can you see i'm like i've clicked once and then again maybe i need to zoom in a little bit uh, podcast. Zoom in a little bit further and turn the gain down on that so that's track one that's my voice and if i click here can you see it's reduced ever so slightly? And if I click again and hold the mouse as I click, I can either drag up to make it louder or drag down. It's kind of snapping a little bit at the moment because I'm not zoomed in enough. But it basically allows you to control like the volume as it goes up or as it goes down. And you can set an anchor point and then a second point for it to kind of fade to. I'm going to zoom in a little bit further just so you can see the volume coming down because that's actually what I'm after here. Um, it can be quite subtle. I might raise that a little bit so you get a better sense of where it's come from. But can you see where it kind of like envelopes and, and pinches a bit? And I'm, I've tried to coincide that. I've done it quite roughly here, but I've tried to coincide that with where my voice starts. And then I might go further out a little bit back to here where my voice stops and go, okay, right at this point, I want it to pinch and continue at a louder volume. So I'll zoom in here and slide it along on the timeline and just find that end point, which is around here. So I'll click again around there. And just drag my mouse down for it to raise. And once I zoom out, you'll be able to get a sense of that a little bit better. So can you see that it's, it's quite roughly done here, but you get an idea of where that second channel is my voice, that first channel is the music. And I've clicked and pinched to like make it go lower, clicked and pinched to raise it again. Um, and because this audio is quite distorted at the moment, it maybe isn't, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to tell, but we'll play through and see. So once I've done that, I'll click back on my selection tool, find the point that I wanna start from and then hit play. A podcast if it was to be thinking about maybe a and like I say it's quite distorted because I've got everything turned up but at the point where my voice comes in that bit that channel's come down podcast if it was to be thinking about maybe a conversation that I'm recording through Zoom which is something that I've happened quite a lot with lots of broadcasts and just thinking about the ways that we might record during during lockdown um I can leave that one and then be picking everything up. But, and then when I'm ready to stop, I can use this. So like I say, quite roughly done. Um, and when we listen back, we notice that maybe that's still a little bit too loud. So that means that pinch needs to come down a little bit further. And like I say, you can zoom in and get that to exactly the level that you need. And the gain is just over here on these individual tracks, when you hover over, so you've got a pan to control what kind of side it comes through on your left and right on the individual tracks and then the gain which you'd kind of want to remain keep at zero but just for the purposes of really quickly show moving volumes up and down um 
you can control that from here. And it just means that everything's at the right level. It's kind of um, to do with volume. How would you go about evening up the sounds at the beginning and the end of a voice of a track? That makes sense. So like you've done it approximately, as you said, at the yeah. beginning and at the end, and it, it sort of more or less looks the same visually but is there a way to make sure that you've actually got the same measurement side to side I'm thinking obviously about my intro and my outro in terms of like the timing of of how long that intro is going to be and how long the bit either side of the, the instrumental or the music track you the, mean? the timing and the volume um yeah. because I don't always trust my ear mm -hmm. so I, I I would like to, to yeah. know that that it is kind of also officially the correct volume and um, yeah yeah level. so if i zoom out a little bit um along here is your counter so that's kind of what corresponds to a minute two minutes etc cetera, etc cetera. um and what i'm going to do quick really quickly is just highlight all of these and bring them to the start so i know that it's at zero um, and then zoom back in But can you see along that top edge where we've got the counter? So just there will signify one minute 15, one minute 30. And I'm not sure what those integers are. I think initially a minute, but the more that you zoom in, the kind of closer together they get. And you can see it's by the second, the more that you've zoomed in on that kind of capacity. And then let me just change back to here and I'll try it on a different section of that envelope so we can kind of analyze it. Clicked once, start my anchor, and clicked again to envelope. I wonder if I zoom in. So there's a way to analyze. Something that I do need to double check on. I'm not 100% sure if it gives you like a, a monitor of when you envelope. It's a really good point. And I think when you're kind of needing to work to a, like a more meticulous level with something that has that or needs that consistency, um, then that's a useful thing to think about. Would it just um, be a case of like having uh, doing a bit of a playback and watching the levels at the top yeah. and where they're reaching to? Yeah, that was my first thought, but I was just wondering whether there was something more specific. But do you remember just up there where we were looking at that recording at the start, um, Susanna? So if I'm playing back, back and kind of like in a particular point where it's kind of come down, perhaps seeing that when my volumes come down, and it's maybe a little bit too short to notice there, um, the lowest point that maybe comes to on here might be an, a, a way of, of monitoring that. But again, you can kind of zoom out, um, sorry, stretch this to make it more, um, more detailed to look at like the specific point that it stops at and then it falls to. So perhaps that's a good way. Sure. I'm not sure if there's a, a more kind of meticulous way of. Um, I mean, in essence, that. it's also reassuring to know that mostly it's done kind of to ear and in mm -hmm. an approximate way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's there's some stuff I can work with there. Thank you. Yeah, good. Um, I think you can use a start and end selection at the bottom to set a fixed length too, if desired. I just type in the duration. So just in here, yeah, that's right. 
and by thinking about four minutes, for example, um, so I'll zoom out a little bit and it brings you to four minutes, 53 seconds on there. So yeah, that's a good point to kind of find the exact moment maybe that it needs to, um, it needs to kind of click to or snap to. Um, along the left where the integers are, if you right click, you can change the level of detail. And just on here. Ah, handy tip. Yeah, I was just trying it now. If you go on the half wave, I think it gives you more numbers. So if you did want to check, double check. Ah, yeah. there we go. And then I think if you drag out the track, it adds more detail as well. Right, okay. Let me not zoom in and go to half wave instead. So maybe that's a useful way of thinking about that as well, Susanna. So thank you for that, Caleb. So on that kind of level monitor there, just by right clicking and selecting half wave, it changes. Um, see if I can put it to another one so you can get an, an idea. Can you see how it zooms in and changes that? I didn't know that. Really handy. Thank you, Caleb. No I just found it as well. Yeah. It's just easier to, to see how the the levels change in in half wave mm -hmm. rather than the other format. Is that what we're thinking? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So can you see where those, if it was to be on that, for example, it's going up to two. And if I move mm. that there, the top point of it is one. And then I guess if mm. I go down even further, um, it will make the top point a 0 0.5. And that, that's where you can think about how where it gets to in correspondence to here. So the zero point on there is almost like the zero point on, on that bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'll have a go with the half wave thing. Yeah. Um, let me have a quick look back to some other tools, some other tips. Um, Equal EQ. So the equalization um, allows you to kind of change your different frequencies within the sound. And the way that I've found is quite quite fun to mess about with and play with a little bit is by using by using the uh, filter curve and. You can either use filter curve or graphic EQ. So if I was to double click on that clip and go to filter curve, come up with this graph and it measures the curve points of the start and end, um, which is kind of split into bass, mids and treble. So bass, mids on that section, the treble on the left hand side. Um, and if I was to click, Yeah, a combination of like the noise reduction, um, combination of the noise reduction, EQ, compress and normalize, brings it to a place that maybe hopefully feels sort of less tinny, gives it a fuller sound. Um, and something that I was just looking at over the last few days, um, the presets. Um, so for example, if I find that the audio, um, is a little bit tinny and needs something else to kind of give it a bit more of a fuller sound or a fuller feel, then you might just use a bass boost. Or if there's a particular thing that I'm thinking about that plays with distance, um, a telephone or a walkie talkie preset and seeing where that's set to, and then maybe kind of manipulating and changing some of these different points are an interesting way of playing with that. So if I click preview and let it do its thing, it will just give a quick um maybe i'll hit okay you can hear a version without can you see the waveform just changed ever so slightly so it shrunk down a little bit after i'd applied the telephone eq preset to it um so without a uh, podcast it's always to be thinking about maybe a conversation that i'm recording through and with uh, podcast it's always to be thinking about maybe a conversation that i'm recording through zoom which is 
I'll play it again, maybe a little bit louder. Without a podcast, if it was to be thinking about maybe a conversation that I'm recording through Zoom, which is and with to be thinking about maybe a conversation that I'm recording. So it's just taken out a little bit of the low end and made it feel a little bit more distant. And that might be, I don't know, if I'm again thinking about the different ways that I might be playing with um distance and something feeling like it's further away thinking about how to take the mid or the low end out of the audio in like making a fictional narrative or a fictional dialogue maybe a useful thing um yeah sure no problem so what i did there let me get back to this one is double clicked on that clip effect filter curve manage i think maybe that window just drops a little bit out of what's sharing so i'll move it up a, a tab manage factory presets can i make this smaller because it doesn't quite pick everything up um and i think it maybe goes up to telephone but just underneath that i have options for treble boost treble cut and walkie talkie so depending again on what like the audio that you're working with is for some of those presets might be useful. And another way of doing the same stuff um, with EQ is to go to the graphic EQ and it just gives you these sliders, which are maybe a little bit more um, restrictive in terms of what they're able to do because it has like a, a limit on that and that capacity and maybe you can't quite think about the presets in the same way. but left hand side um start so left hand side is a treble mids so they're in the middle and bass towards the right hand side and you can kind of quite intuitively just play around and see what results are, are being given as, as you work through and as you work with that um how are we doing for time 12 30. the next thing that i want to quickly walk through is compressing and the compressor compressor allows the audio to be amplified without clipping um so it gave, it kind of thinks about uh, uh, the dynamic range of your audio so i'm going to kind of go back to this one i think And what I might do first before I do compressor is the amplify tool. So when I have two tracks at the same time, if I just want to be listening to one of them, I can hit the solo button over here and it will just play what's on that channel and it will gray out and mute the other one. So that's quite handy and useful to just, um, if you're working with multiple tracks and it gets a bit confusing just hitting that solo button kind of isolates one of them um so if i double click and i'm going to just quickly go with the amplify which is really straightforward but a, a useful thing maybe to to kind of treat some of the audio that you might work with um and as it says on the tin kind of amplifiers will make louder but at the moment because that's quite loud i want to bring it bring it down a bit so instead of moving it upwards, I'm going to go to the left hand side and just bring it down by minus four. And you'll see that change. And I can preview that as I do it just to check and see what it's like. So before that clip, if I kind of don't allow it to do its thing, that clip was up and peeking and hitting the red. Um, on my playback meter and when i preview it it just brings it down a little bit and makes it a little bit more of a of a comfortable listening experience and isn't so heavy on the ears uh, and can you see it just shrinks everything down a little bit um, and then if i go to the compressor again i can just be thinking about what the kind of highest point 
of, of the audio should get to. Um, yeah, it can kind of go both ways. And like I say, there's almost like three or four different ways of doing the same thing within Audacity and just finding the one that works for you is probably a useful, useful way to think about it. Um, the compressor, like I say, is just thinks about the dynamic range of where the uh, audio gets to. So if it was to be thinking about speech or with the voice, something that I found was that the ratio is usually around two, two to one. If it was something that was singing and you're kind of like exerting a little bit more energy from your lungs and it's kind of louder at points and then to a whisper, you probably want to slide it up to around here to four for a four to one scale. Um, and I wonder whether there's some more information on that. Actually, I might do a look around and see if I can include some handy kind of templates for what that ratio should be. But I'm going to just keep it maybe halfway between the two at three to one. Um, just bearing in mind that some of the earlier bits from that clip were, were kind of quieter and some of the moments here are quite loud, but it will kind of bring it up in the other direction if that's what you need. And for this particular kit, like I say, because it's bled out and it's from, from the internet and because there's a lot going on on it, it sort of has brought it up to a point that's, that's quite loud again. So I'm just going to go back and keep it on that level for the amplification. Um, And then there's the normalize tool. Um, and the normalizers maybe responding to that question that somebody had a little earlier on. But the normalize basically finds um, the peaks in multiple tracks, or uh, not necessarily multiple, but it could be just in, in just the one, but it finds the peaks in multiple tracks and finds a balance um, and a healthy kind of range that makes it easy to easier to listen to and um, to do that again just thinking about zero being like the top point perhaps um you can kind of set where it goes up to so you want to leave a little bit of room if zero is the loudest point so the default is to put it to one point uh, minus minus one <laughs> And if I bring that down a bit, let's say to minus four, what does that sound like? And again, each time that I'm changing, you can see on that playback level recording that it, from being in the red, it's maybe getting to a lower point. That means it's slightly easier on the ears. And it will bring it down ever so slightly again. And you can do that for multiple tracks. So if it was to highlight both of these channels, edit, sorry, effects, normalize. And it's because that one's already done, it's just changed the second track. So the two are kind of corresponding to one another. Um, If you've got two different voices, one quieter than the other, would you amplify the quieter one and then compress and normalize? Or will compression and normalization do the trick on their own? If you've got two different voices, one quieter than the other, would you amplify the quieter one and then compress and normalize? Or will compression and normalization do the trick on their own? Um, I'm assuming that they're on the same track and maybe that gets quite difficult. Um, no, not on the same track. If you've got a dialogue, say, between two different people and one of them mm -hmm. has perhaps a much better mic than the other mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or just a louder voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are they using amplification and is there a risk I that think, it could degrade the quality? Is think, it enough just to use compression and normalisation on their own? I think compression and normalisation would be my kind of thought or my go-to. Um, especially about normalization because it puts everything sort of in context of what's in the whole kind of project or in the whole kind of workspace um but there might be sections by ear that you go actually wait now that's a little bit too quiet and it's kind of maybe specific and you can highlight that particular section or that particular moment where something's particularly kind of not being picked up but i think that normalization should should do the trick um 
and yeah, I guess it again, it depends on the sort of the function or the intention or where the audio kind of lives. And at times there might be stuff that you want to be more chaotic or you want to be kind of like interlapping and interlinking and, and layered. Um, and it's still really useful to think about how maybe you kind of clean that up and make sure it's not clipping and distorted too much. Um, cause it really does kind of change things. Um, but that kind of process of either the noise reduction and getting a noise profile, um, and then doing the EQ and then the compression and then the normalizing is something that I try to do with almost everything that I'm working with at the moment, just to make sure it's going through the same kind of processes and making sure that it's being cleaned up. And then once I've done it on sort of my individual tracks, like I say, I might go over and drag it to another project and go, okay, so that's kind of like the repair bit that's been done and now it can be worked on in, in the project. Um, but it really does depend on sort of what material we're working with, I think. Um, how are we for time? 22. Do people have any kind of questions or any thoughts? I wanted to kind of leave some space to maybe try and see if there are things that people would thought of or wanted to ask maybe. Um, and hopefully that going back to that recording and having this PDF is just a way of, like I say, familiarizing with some of the basic ways of navigating the interface and what some of those tools do. And then that kind of audio processing step four step kind of guide, hopefully is something useful as well for people to think about. Um, and the more that you're adding things and working with things, there are different sort of ways of PDF will be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, the more channels that you add, um, I think it starts to get a little bit more kind of complex, but also you start to find your own ways of either working with shortcuts or working with particular kind of buttons that are already there. Um, so having a foundation base layer knowledge of those, I think maybe would be um, quite useful to think about. And like I say, in the video recording and in the PDF. Um, Slightly different topic, but what field, micro, field microphone do you use for things like recording water? So I use, and it's something I've got quite recently, the Zoom H4n. I was borrowing one from a friend for quite a while. Um, but the thing that I find with that is, and I've not got one at the moment, is that it picks up quite a lot of stuff when I'm walking or if like I've kicked a stone or something or if there's something that's like bounced against me, it quite easily picks up some of those sounds. And I can change it by using the microphone volume, but also having a kind of like um, like really small handheld tripod solves that just so it's maybe like not directly in contact with your hand. Um, so yeah, is there something you can see? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of go between using a, HM, a H4n and also the voice memos on my phone, depending on where I am or if there's a particular thing that I want to kind of get into. Um, Tascam DR05 is good for beginners and less many. Good suggestion. We'll add that to the list. Yeah. Any other things that people would recommend in terms of um, what they might use to record? Any suggestions for microphones for singing or for speech? Um, any thoughts, any suggestions, anyone in the comments? At the moment, I am messing around with this, uh, this app called Voicey, um, which enables you to use your, your Apple headphones. I um, wonder if there's a USB microphone to improve an iPhone. And yeah, you can get these kind of extensions that plug into like the charger port of the, of the Apple phones um, that are quite useful. I wonder, I wonder if I can include some of those on the PDF when it goes around as well, Veronica. Um, just looking back over, you mentioned recording mono as export. Ah, it's Yingsook. Hi, Yingsook. Um, you mentioned recording mono and exporting as stereo. Can you show how it can be done? Yeah, sure. I can do that really quickly. Um, let me share screen again. So I will get rid of that. 
and so if I was to be recording directly through Audacity, I'm just going to run this off really quickly. Um, so I've got my one track. I have done all of the kind of audio processing, cleaned it up a little bit. Let's just imagine that that's already happened. And then I can um, where is it that I do that? Ah, oh, there we go, it's right in front of me. Duplicate that track. So at the moment it's mono. And if I duplicate and then down here, it's exactly the same, but just gone on to two tracks. Um, down here, if I make sure that they're both highlighted. So let me do it. Click on the drop down. So usually it will have the name of whatever the file is, but click on the drop down once they're both highlighted and just make stereo track. And can you see that bit there? It's just kind of combine the two. So that again, made my one track and go to edit, duplicate or command D, or if you want another shortcut, you can set that up. It separates them into two or adds another into two tracks. Drop down, make stereo track. And it just means that when it plays for a speaker or plays through headphones, it will come through on the left and right on both sides. Um, let's see more comments. There's some suggestions in there for microphones that Susanna uses for the podcast. And Nathaniel saying, I think Zoom make one for the phone as well. That's really handy. I'm going to have a look into some of those as well. So thank you for sharing. Um, and all of these, these kind of links and suggestions are really, really great. I'm going to include all of those on this PDF too for people. Um, not for field recording, just home recording. Okay, cool. Ah, yeah, that's a really good question. That's something that I've missed. Um, so Claire asking, how can I make my file WAV? My current recordings won't import to Audacity as MP4. Um, oh, they won't import. Interesting. Yeah, it just um, let me see what it comes up with. Hang on. Um, it tells me off. When I do it. So it says blah 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 blah. Um without the operational FF MG MPEG file, Audacity cannot open this type of file. Otherwise, you need to convert it to a supported audio format such as RAT, WAV or AIFF. Okay. Yeah. Somebody makes a comment, Susanna's saying there's lots of websites. You can use a converter, absolutely. So it's something that I do quite a lot as well, where sometimes I'm ripping things or sometimes I've recorded things and it doesn't want to import into whatever program I'm, work I'm working with. But just to kind of like uh, MP4, or M what file type was it? Yeah, MP4 um, to WAV, MP4 to MP3, whatever kind of um, conversion you need, there's usually a website that exists where you can upload that file and it will do it within five minutes for quite for oh, in, so for bad. quite quite quick and for free as well, which is yeah something that Lauren mentions. Um, nice. Thank you. And then just really quickly as well, if you when you say we've kind of finished with the project, um, and the different ways of maybe exporting it are quite important to think about as well, and whether it needs to be a WAV or uh, an MP3. Um, MP3s are still good quality. WAV's like the highest, maybe, the, the, the high quality, but it means a bigger file size. Um, so for, for myself, I usually just try and work with MP3s just to kind of save my computer from chugging along and not being able to do stuff and taking up memory and space. But depending on, again, on where it's going to and what it's needed and used for, the audio um, can be exported and literally just by going to file, export as MP3, export as WAV. Um, I'm not sure what an OGG is actually, but um, you've got lots of different options of how and where and why you might want to export things. Um, if the input 
is mp3 files does it make it different if you export as mp3 or web no i don't think so i don't think so i think once you've kind of like gone through a process of cleaning things up but um again just in terms of for me the thing that i i don't know some people are like really I, I don't have the space basically on my computer and it takes up space for other people when you send them things if they're in webs so i try to keep things in mp3s but um yeah, the WAV is kind of a slightly higher quality, but a bigger file size. I just assumed that I had nothing to gain from doing that because I'm recording in MP3. Mm -hmm. And that, and yeah, therefore I, I thought that you can get higher quality yeah. file yeah. in the end. Yeah, I think it's... Like, you think you can. I think it just is related to, to the file size, but I might be wrong. If you kind of have been working with MP3 recordings and then putting them into here, but... Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anybody else knows any more about that. But my understanding has always been about kind of quality and file size. But I'm not sure if it maybe, maybe makes too much of a difference if you've got MP3 files that you've been working with initially. Um, I'll have a check on that. This is a, um, a real novice question, Ashley, but... Um, oh, no, no, no novice questions at all. They're all kind of <laughs> valid and relevant. Go on. I know you mentioned before, like, um, you doubled um, the audio that's on screen and then you were saying it comes through both headphones. Mm -hmm. um, why, like, I, that just really confused me, like, the layout, like, because when you record a mono track, it just seems to come up as one, you know, like, one recording, but then mm -hmm. the audio tracks are always doubled. Is that why they're doubled, so that they go yeah. through both headphones? So usually it's because it's record you know on this setting along the top and i changed it i think it was something that i didn't do earlier actually but you can change to a mono or stereo um okay. and i think a lot of stuff is like goes through stereo usually and um, when you record or when we listen and when we play back it's kind of come through two sides left and right um oh or in the headphones left and right um but it seems like from the things that i've looked around that um as far as i can tell a lot of the microphones kind of do stuff in, in mono or it's, it, it suggests a lot of people suggest making the recordings directly into audacity in mono and then you can kind of clean them up and, and double them up again um, okay. so yeah i hope that clears that up yeah that's fab good um if you're exhibiting an audio work through speakers as mp3 okay or should you have the highest quality possible um uh, yeah, and again, I, th I think I'm maybe thinking about things in a kind of like digital. I work quite a lot with radio as well and at the moment, and a lot of like the music and radio related stuff's done through MP3, but perhaps um, thinking about kind of an installation or an exhibition, um, there you'd maybe want to get the best quality. So perhaps, yeah, a WAV. And MP3 is okay, definitely. I've kind of used MP3s in shows before, but depending on what, equipment you're using and what's compatible maybe a, a wav might be useful but again it kind of de depends on on the context and what technical equipment's available in, in that particular moment in time um yeah i had um a bit of a back to basics question which was right at the beginning um of your sort of tutorial which was mm -hmm. about the settings that we choose. So um, like, why do we choose like the four, what's it, 44,100 Hertz as yeah. the sample rate and 16 bit and what do those things mean? And like, in what, what context would you use different settings? As far as I know, again, I think it's the ways that I understand it is it's because it's related to what my computer is able to process. So Hertz is like a measure of frequency, decibels measures like, the level of sound and hertz is the frequency um and six 44 100 and 16 bit are kind of like as far as i know the best kind of like combination that my computer is able to process or that a lot of computers are usually able to process so it kind of runs smoothly um yeah so i could be wrong on that but as far as i know it's just a kind of like compatibility thing i think cool thank you no problem can you just recap the shortcuts? You know, you were saying like you gave the example of an S for silence. Yeah. Can you yeah, just yeah. recap that where to find that? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
let's see another one. Um, so if you hover over, like I say, sometimes it gives you a shortcut of that particular kind of command. Um, and you can see that it pops up sort of, um, of course, none of them are showing now. There we go. So on the edit, a lot of them have the kind of like all of them. Um, and if I wanted to change duplicate, for example, to be, I don't know why, but if I wanted to change it to be the number two, then I would go to my preferences, um, keyboard, look for duplicate by typing it into the search. Click on it there. And in that box underneath, just double click, put the number two in, set. Okay. And now when I highlight that clip, I'll just zoom out a little bit and press the number two on my keyboard. It just puts it directly into a new track and it duplicates it. That's awesome. Thank you. No problem. Could you remind us how to do half wave with the music track again, please? Looking at my own project and not finding it. Um, if I remember rightly, it was over here. And you right click. And then just there and it will change. And you can see those numbers change there. I think that's right. Got it. Thank you. No problem. And thank you, Caleb, for, for having a quick look around and suggesting that. Um, are there any key things you need to think about when developing sound for installations or what's your approach to doing this? Yeah, good question. Um, the room, what are the acoustics of the room like? A lot of them are kind of empty, empty spaces, so it gets quite echoey or quite reverby. So if there are things that you're thinking about, um, about how the sound bounces around the room. That needs to be a thing that maybe to, to think about um, what shape the room is, um, what kind of height people are listening from is something that I'm quite interested in as well. I always find that like, um, I don't know, a lot of the, the, there's lots of photos I've been looking at, at like, um, of concert halls and the speakers are always positioned really high up with the audience like seated or down there and that way as well as something on stage and just having these like multiple kind of directions um, maybe something to think about but yeah quite often it's to do with what the room can kind of facilitate or what capacity it has to kind of have sound be projected into it um, yeah, thank you no problem I hope that helps. And yeah, I've just seen a comment about directional speakers as well, which I don't know too much about, but I think somebody was telling me about some recently. Um, it could be an interesting thing to maybe have in mind or to do some research on potentially. Yeah, I've, I've worked with directional speakers where you walk into a sweet spot and you can hear it and then you walk slightly further away, you hear nothing, mm -hmm. um, depending on the room, of course, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to play with. Yeah, definitely. Especially if it's kind of in a situation where, um, I don't know, there are other works in the room. Where, uh, you know I mean, if it's a group exhibition or if there are multiple people that come through and there's sort of other other noises that are circulating in the space. Um, seen them in. And yeah, thank you, Holly and Turf and Uma as well for for the invitation to to, to be involved with this really enjoyable. Um